This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. About, um, I'm not talking about the early study. I'm not talking about environmental risk factors for autism directly today, although I will touch on some topics related to this. I'm talking about um, the topic of, of healthcare claims data and how they might be able to inform research on autism outcomes and autism uh, risk factors. And, and what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of an overview on how uh, healthcare claims data have been used in, in autism research. And then I'm going to transition and talk a little bit about a project that I've been involved in for the last couple of years. It really was sort of the, the, the genesis for this talk, the study of health outcomes in children with autism and their families. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna highlight a couple of things that we did in that project for you today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about work that we did validating um, an autism diagnosis in a claims database, which is a very important step if you're gonna build autism research on this data source. And then I'm gonna present um, an analysis that we did on a health outcome. We, we, we looked at um, the relationship between autism as a potential risk factor for increased injuries in kids using this database. And I'll, I'll present, present uh, um, some of our results from that work to you today here. And then I'm going to close by some work we did uh, as part of the project that was sort of um, forward-looking. It was, it was trying to look at this uh, particularly robust claims data set that we had access to and to try to think about whether or not we could use that um, information platform to inform studies about autism risk factors. And then I'll make some general comments at the end. So, so that's the outline. So, so, so healthcare claims in um, in autism research. So, healthcare claims data have really been important in 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 in, uh, um, in studying health, medical service utilization, and costs for a variety of outcomes, including um, including autism. So, these are a couple of. Um, Fairly recent papers that I that I pulled, both 2013 papers. This is a a, a study just published in in, in JAD, uh, Wang et al., uh, Dave Mandel, who's been um, a leader in looking at autism costs and outcome using administrative data sets, and Lindsay Lauer, who works with me. They were all in this paper. And this is a very nice. Um, piece of work that compared healthcare costs in a group of children who were enrolled in, 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 in Medicaid as their primary insurance source to a group of children who were enrolled in private insurance. And they had access to uh, Medicaid data and a private insurance database from, from 23 states. They, they, they looked at the, um, uh, the calendar year was 2003 for this. Uh, they, they found um, something interesting and perhaps n not unexpected was that the average uh, cost in that year for a child with ASD who was insured by Medicaid, the, the medical care costs that Medicaid reimbursed for was about $23,000, where on the private insurance side it was $5,000. And most of the difference in costs was related to the um, behavioral health services that Medicaid will pay for in, in many states that private insurance um, will, will not. So this was an interesting study focused on costs contrasting Medicaid insurance costs to, to private, private insurance costs. Um, another paper recently published also looked at Medicaid insurance data from the state of Mississippi. And it looked at utilization and costs associated with psychotropic drug use among um, individuals with autism. And they looked, at, they looked at all ages under 65, although the majority of the subjects in the data set uh, were, were, were kids. About 80% of them were, were, were kids under 21. And again, they were focused on psychotropic drug use, and they found that two-thirds of the individuals insured by Medicaid with autism 
in this Mississippi database, two thirds of them had a claim for a psychotropic uh, drug. There were um, uh, 13,000 claims in total, and the average individual with autism had, uh, had, had about 10 claims for psychotropic drugs uh, in, in the year that they looked at, which was 2007. And those, those um, costs, account, those accounted for $2 million in costs to the Medicaid program in, in, in Mississippi, and antipsychotics were the most common prescription used, also the most expensive, and um, the implication was that, that perhaps this called for some sort of a cost-benefit analysis of that particular class of drugs in the state. So this is the kind of thing that, that, that claims data has most commonly been used for uh, in autism and, and also for, for, for other, other conditions. Um, However, there's been some suggestions that maybe we can capitalize on claims data to study health outcomes, not so much to study utilization and cost, but to actually study health endpoints associated with a range of different uh, conditions. But this really hasn't been um, uh, implemented uh, very much for, 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 for autism. This uh, paper, going back to uh, 1999, written by Birnbaum, argues that, uh, makes, makes the case that in addition to doing the obvious, which is focusing on costs and utilization, healthcare claims data might really be important for, for, this, for outcomes research. Here's an, an example from a different disease state. This is a claims-based study of uh, a series of individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease. And the health outcome under study here is pneumonia risk. So the question is, um, are individuals with inflammatory bowel degree, uh, disease at excess risk for pneumonia? Uh, IBD is typically treated with uh, immunosuppression. So there's this idea that, that pneumonia risk is, is associated with that treatment. So, uh, by assembling a, a, a fairly large series of private health insurance claims in this case, uh, the researchers were able to identify a series of 100,000 individuals who had either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and uh, 400,000 in a comparison group who didn't have the disease, and, uh, and were able to show that um, there was nearly double the risk of bacterial pneumonia in the group of individuals with IBD compared to uh, the, the comparison group. And this, this graphic just shows the annual uh, pneumonia incidence per uh, 10,000 in the uh, non-IBD group in the light blue, and then the Crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis group combined in the, in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the blue bars. So, so this is the kind of work that can be done, looking at healthcare outcomes associated with a particular condition in, 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 uh, in, in claims data, but hasn't been done. Uh, to any great extent yet with, with, with autism. So lastly, there, there's also been the suggestion that uh, administrative data, at least, maybe not claims specifically, um, should be used and are appropriately used in risk factor research. And again, here, when we think about administrative data that are used in risk factor studies, we think more of um, registry databases as opposed to health insurance claims. And, and, and certainly there are lots of examples of the way registry databases have been used in risk factor research in, in, in autism. Um, and and um, this, this paper, uh, written by uh, Jorn Olsen, who's been involved in the Denmark disease registries, again presents this framework. This is um, uh, from 1996. It's, well established that these administrative, that secondary data or administrative data can be really capitalized on for epidemiologic questions about disease risk factors. And we've seen in the, in the um, uh, uh, work that's come out of the Scandinavian re registries in particular that, that this data source has been well capitalized on. This is a um, uh, well-known well -known paper from, from 2010 from the Denmark registry showing a link between uh, hospitalization, maternal hospitalization in pregnancy during the first, uh, uh, for infection during the first trimester with a doubling of autism risk. And, and this, this finding linking hospitalization for infection with autism risk is in some ways um, uh, viewed as, as a potential limitation of the administrative data because the Denmark registries only capture hospitalized events. So they were only able to, in this, stu to in, in, in this uh, uh, the implementation of this study, consider infection that led to hospitalization. And it turns out that they had a very you know, provocative and interesting result, that, 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 that uh, uh, those hospitalized events in the first trimester had this fairly strong um, association with increased autism risk. But again, it was an administrative data source. 
They had to capitalize on what they had, and, and this is what they were able to do. That's been followed up on in Denmark in this recently published analysis from the Danish birth cohort, where they were actually able to, in a superior data source, a cohort of pregnant women who've been followed actively or since early in pregnancy asked many questions about what they've experienced during pregnancy, biosamples collected, and then the children followed on for a variety of health outcomes, including autism. And this cohort has given rise to nearly a thousand cases of autism. So there's a large number of cases of autism that they can look at and contrast to the non-cases that emerge from this cohort. But they were able to look here at a range of, of, of variables for infection, not just hospitalization for infection. And interestingly, they found that when they looked at less severe episodes of infection, they didn't see any association. And the only inkling of an association with autism risk that they saw really was for more severe infections incurring during the first trimester. Um, and, 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 and they had a variety of ways of looking at that, including infection, infections that um, were reportedly associated with fever of long duration, um, seven days or more. So, Interestingly, the, the, the findings that emerged from the prospective cohort study sort of supported the administrative data findings from the Danish uh, registry system. Okay, so, so we don't have registries in the United States for the most part. Um, there are other administrative sources that can be used in autism risk factor research, and here in California, there's been a variety of studies that have been that have capitalized on the DDS database for um, finding autism cases, and those have been creatively linked to um, other sources of data about potential risk factors. There's been work done linking DDS cases to databases on environmental pollutants, for example. Um, our friends, we have some friends here from the Kaiser Permanente Health System. They have a very sophisticated um, administrative data system that's been done to, to drive some excellent work on autism risk factors. But in general, these are, these are exceptions. Um, so um, one um, possible way of expanding the use of administrative data on, on, on risk factors would be to look towards healthcare claims. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the study of health outcomes in children with autism and their families. And um, this was a, uh, a project that involved a large team of individuals. The, um, the work was awarded to the Lewin Group, who's a, a, a nonprofit health research um, uh, organization. Um, there were other partners involved, including Optum Insight and Opt Optum Behavioral Health, and then a team of, our, of, of myself and my colleagues from Drexel University. Um, we also involved uh, Mary Grace Kaiser Yale from, from Miami to help us with the uh, validation study I'm going to talk about in a few moments. And this was funded through a contract awarded by NIMH. NIMH, NIMH issued a, a request for a proposal specifically trying to um, catalyze more work on health insurance claims in, in autism. And the group led by Lewin that I was a part of was fortunate enough to, um, uh, to, to be awarded this contract. And we spent about two years um, um, uh, engaged, in, engaged in this work. The primary goal was to contrast uh, healthcare outcomes and costs. So we did look at costs in this project. I'm just not going to focus on that in, in today's talk because, as I mentioned, that's been sort of a traditional application of healthcare claims. I'm not an economist. It's not my area of expertise. I'm going to focus more on the work that we did on healthcare outcomes in, um, in, in, in children with ASD. And, and, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to contrast a series of healthcare outcomes in a large group of children identified with autism spectrum disorders and, and select family members with a, a non-ASD comparison group and their family members. And then a secondary goal was to try to do some exploration of whether or not this claims database that we were querying primarily for outcomes and cost might also have the potential to, to help us with autism risk factor research. So I'm going to focus on the healthcare outcomes and the risk factor research. I'm going to focus on the work that we did with uh, children. I'm not going to talk so much about the work that we did with family members, although I'll give you an idea of, of, of the family members that we included in our data set. And we will talk about moms a little bit when we get to the portion on, 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 on risk factors. This, this slide talks a little bit about the, the study sample that we were able to put together. And it illustrates the, the um, uh, capacity 
capacity of claims databases to generate large numbers, which is something that excites epidemiologists. Um, we were able to put together a, um, a series of, uh, of uh, um, uh, from, from the commercial health plan, we were able to assemble data on 62 million enrollees, adults and children, um, who had medical, pharmacy, and behavioral health coverage between 2001 and 2009. Then what we did to whittle this down is we, we wanted to make sure that everybody had at least six months of continuous enrollment. So folks move on and off of different insurances and we wanted to have some base level of continuity and we picked six months as an, as an initial cut on that. And that moves, that moves the, the, the sample size down quite a bit to 30 million, still fairly sizable. Um, then we, we, we isolated to, to children identified for this study as, as under, under uh, uh, 21. And that got us down to around nine, nine million. Then from that, we eliminated the individuals who had RETS or CDD, and then looked from, from, from that, from what was left, the nine million or so who were left, uh, looked for an, an indication of ASD, which at the first cut was the presence of just any claim with an ASD ICD-9 code. And from that, we were able to assemble a group of 46,000 children uh, with ASD, so an exceedingly large uh, sample size. Then, um, in, in addition, you see in the boxes to the side, we, we, we had other data sets that were assembled um, on the parents of these kids and um, siblings. And then for a comparison group, we selected approximately three um, kids who did not have any indication of ASD for each child who did have an indication of ASD. So that's about 140,000 in the comparison cohort. Um, and we we're also able to build a data set for parents and sibling of the comparison uh, group children as well. So a, a huge data set. What did we have available on this very large uh, sample? Well, we had, we had the, the medical, the pharmacy, and the behavioral health claims data. Um, that comes from all service delivery sites and includes all covered services. We have information on the particular diagnostic codes triggering the, the, the individual encounter. And you also have procedure codes information, which, which are, there are a couple of conventions for coding procedures that are delivered during healthcare encounters, CPT or, or HICPIC codes. And then we also had some socioeconomic data that we were able to link into the claims database um, on, on race, ethnicity, and household income. Th these are not um, high quality individual level data. We did have individual level race ethnicity information on about 30% of the sample, but the rest of this is imputed through a fairly complex uh, algorithm from information that comes in at the census block level. So it's imputed back to the, to the individuals. But it does give us the ability to, to, to add some uh, descriptive socioeconomic data to this claims database. Okay, so that's what we had to, had to work with. So the first thing we wanted to do is we, we had, as we moved in this foray into trying to see what we could gain from this database on studying health outcomes in kids with autism and, and, and exploring the idea of risk factor work in this data, was we wanted, to, we wanted to take a look at how good a job these data did at identifying kids with autism, right? I mean, this is not uh, research data with, with um, um, study visits planned with, with intensive one-on-one -on -one examinations. This is an existing data source uh, assembled for the purpose of you know, paying people's medical bills. And we wanted to see whether or not what we, whether or not the kids who are identified as having ASD seem to, in fact, have ASD. So we, we did a validation study, and it was a, it was a chart review validation study. And um, it surmounts the challenge, it, it surmounts the obstacle that, that we're, we're not, you know, we can't do direct observation. So going to the medical chart, is the, is, the, is the next best option. Um, still difficult to implement if you're thinking about a health claims database that comes from every state in the United States. Um, so, but, but doable. Um, Optum Health, who maintains this database, and, and, and I should say that all the individuals that are in this database are, uh, um, are, are, have private insurance from a family of related health plans. And Optum Health uh, can employ and does employ 
uh, firms to do chart reviews for a variety of, of, uh, of operational things that the health plan does. So it's possible there's a mechanism for doing chart reviews, but, but they're constrained in the way that they can be done. Um, you need to get consent from the physician or the provider to review the chart. You can only review the charts for the period of time that's covered for your study. And it was also, it's only possible for us to select, and this was as much a resource constraint as anything else, uh, one chart per subject. So it was not, you know, we, we had some constraints that we were facing. And this chart review data source was going to be valuable, but, you know, we, we have to be um, um, conscious of, of, of what we were dealing with with this, with this particular gold standard. We also wanted to uh, uh, go about this to gain um, information about the positive and negative predictive value of, um, of a claims-based diagnosis. So when we think about uh, positive predictive value, what we're talking about is if we identify a child through some claims-based algorithm, and it could be just the presence of one diagnostic code, we want to know what proportion of those kids that we identify through the claims-based algorithm have, are confirmed as having autism through our gold standard, the medical chart review. And the negative predictive value, it, we wanted to also have some inference about negative predictive value, which is also quite important, which is if, if a child does not have an indication of autism, right, what proportion of those kids really in the medical record show as not having autism? It's the negative predictive value. So, so th there really hasn't been very much work done looking at this kind of uh, um, criterion validity of a claims-based autism diagnosis. There was one study done in Canada that validated the administrative diagnosis uh, um, in, in, in the Canadian health system data, but th they went about it in a much different way. They, they had a group of kids who had been evaluated at a multi-specialty clinic for autism, much like what you have here at, at, at the mind, and then they, had ac they got, gained access to the uh, administrative data from the health system. And, and looked at what system of codes from the, from the health system would generate the best sensitivity and specificity against the, the information that they had from the evaluations. And they found that they were able to have a, a claims-based definition, and what they settled on as the best was just a single diagnostic code of autism in the, in the administrative records. And, and that had a 69% sensitivity against the multi-specialty evaluation and a 77% specificity. But the way this sample was selected is somewhat problematic because the specificity is probably an underestimate because they're basing their specificity only on the kids who were referred to the specialty center, right? So there are all those kids who weren't referred who were also true negatives. And, and they were not counted in their specificity calculation, so they really underestimated their, their specificity. And, and they may also have overestimated their sensitivity, because again, these are kids where there was worry that they had autism, they made it to a multi-specialty clinic, so the chances that they were, they were confirmable, even through the administrative claim, was probably higher than in the population. So, so this is really the only validation study that's been done, so you know, the work that we were doing was, was adding to this, to this base. So what we did is we, we, we drew a sample of 400 kids um, from, from, this, from this base cohort. That was our target. We wanted to do this validation on 400 kids. We wanted to look at two different alternative classifications, one where the kids would need to have two, at least two claims with an ASD diagnosis, and, and another where one would suffice. So if they had one claim with an ASD diagnosis, they would be, they would be considered a case based, um, a claims-based autism case. The first group, they had to have two. Um, and then what we also wanted to do to help us gain some inference about negative predictive value is we wanted to look at a, a group of uh, kids who did not have any ASD codes, but they had codes for other conditions that are associated with ASD. So these would be potential false negatives. And, and you see up on the slide some of the codes that we included in that list. It includes other things, things that are associated with, with the autism phenotype, including um, tubal sclerosis, um, speech and language delay, uh, static encephalopathy codes, et cetera. So we wanted to look in that group to see whether or not there were kids who really had autism masquerading in that group, even though they did not have a claim for, 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 for an ASD. So we did some oversampling because we wanted to, we wanted to um, pull charts that we thought would be most in, informative. So we, uns we oversampled younger age kids, kids who had longer enrollment periods, and kids who had uh, um, in the claims database had more claims. 
Now, we, we, we oversampled on, 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 on purpose, but we, when we calculate our positive and predictive values, we, we reweight so that the estimates of positive and negative predictive value apply to the whole um, population. So when we get the charts, what do we do? We abstracted the charts following a modification of the approach that's used by the CDC autism surveillance system, the ADAM system, the system that gives you the, the uh, every, uh, autism prevalence estimates for the United States that are updated every couple of years, one in 88 now. Um, that surveillance system, and, and many of you I know are familiar with this, some of you may not be, that's a records-based surveillance system. So the ADAM system assembles records from clinical providers and educational providers and has developed a very reliable, repeatable, standard way of abstracting those records. So we, apl we applied that system, adapted it a little bit because we only had clinical records and we only had the one clinical record. We adapted it for the records that we pulled on this, on this sample. And then we calculated the positive and negative predictive value. Um, um, we calculated the positive predictive value for each of these two potential case definitions requiring two claims or, 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 or one claim. The gold standard from the chart review. We had two levels of gold standard. One was level one was you had to meet full ADAM criteria. And to meet full ADAM criteria, um, you have to have a series of documented behaviors in the chart that are consistent with, with DSM-4 criteria. It's a, very, it's a high bar. So we had a level two uh, confirmation criteria which said that, okay, if the chart had partial documentation of behaviors, and we had an algorithm for doing this, uh, that would be enough for level two. And also if the chart just said that the child, if there was an opinion from the clinician saying that the child, based on their evaluation, had autism, again, a lower bar, um, we would consider that um, a validation. So this is, this is a, uh, a complicated flow chart that I'm not going to go through. It just prompts me to talk a little bit about a couple of things related to this exercise. I mentioned that we wanted to get about 400 charts in this. Um, so we initially sampled uh, um, a larger number. We had a contact physicians. There was a refusal rate of about 25% or so. Um, we also did uh, a, a few other things that you would you'd want to see in a study like this. We did some uh, re-abstraction. We um, had uh, uh, different abstractors uh, abstract the same chart and to, ma to maintain inter-rater reliability. And also when we reviewed the charts to, at, the, at the end to determine whether or not they met criteria, we had a subsample reviewed by two experts to maintain inter-rater reliability and, and, and CAPAs were high above 85% for both of those steps. All right, so, so, so what do we find? So, so on the, this table presents the results for the positive predictive value. And again, that's the proportion of kids who are called an autism case based on the claims, what proportion met criteria on the chart review. And, and to, the, to the left of the slide is, are the positive predictive values based only on the very high bar of meeting full ADAM criteria. And then on, 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 the, on the right, the positive predictive value is calculated for, for including those who met at the high bar and those who also met at the level two, which is if the chart said that the kid has autism or if the behavioral uh, uh, descriptions were, were, were um, partially consistent with the, the Adam diagnosis. And um, if you look, there's unweighted and then reweighted estimates. And, and the first thing that you'll notice if you can compare and contrast the unweighted and the weighted estimates, they're very, very similar, identical. So the, the oversampling that we did didn't really affect these results. So I'll, I think I'll show you, uh, actually I won't, this will be the only results shot I, I show you, but for other sub-analyses we did, we were able to rely just on the un, unweighted estimates. So if, if, we, if we look on the left-hand side first against the, against the level one gold standard, the higher bar, the, um, the, the group one, which required two claims, um, had a positive predictive value of around 61%. And uh, the, the, the um, uh, positive predictive value for the uh, group one or two, which would mean including the kids who just had one mention, right, one claim of autism, that brought the positive predictive value down a good bit, down to, into, down to the 40% range. So that's not that encouraging, but I think that the, the, the ADAM criteria is a very high bar. So if we look to the right side, where we include level one or level two gold standard, um, we, see that, we see that we're doing much better, and that the positive predictive values are up around 90% um, uh, uh, um, for the, um, the group one, two claim requirement. 
for requiring one claim, the positive predictive value is, is down around 74%. So we, we made a decision based on this that we would, we would move forward with this requiring two claims for ASD to have sufficient positive predictive value. So in the rest of the work that we do, we only included kids who had two claims. Negative predictive value. Of the 60 kids that we targeted for that enriched group who had those other diagnoses, only one of them on the charts showed as having uh, indication of ASD, and that was in, at, the, at the level two. So um, a very small proportion. So while we can't estimate at negative predictive value directly, realizing that we only study those who had these, these diagnoses that may put you at risk for being a, um, a, a false negative, all the other individuals who don't have any of these indications is going to be a very low rate of autism in, in, in those folks. So, so the negative predictive value is going to be very high, which is, which is expected. Um, so what did we learn? We decided that two or more claims with an ASD diagnosis was associated with good prediction. Um, as good as we could confirm from the, the way we were able to construct the, the chart review exercise. But it's not perfect. So we wanted to get a sense of what the impact of the misclassification that might be introduced by not having perfect prediction, if you're using claims-based diagnosis, might be. So we, we took an approach that's been developed in epidemiologic research to sort of assess the impact of this possible error in classification. And so we, we ran a little simulation where we assumed that there might be um, uh, uh, a health outcome associated with ASD. So in this case, if ASD status is the predictor of a health outcome, and I'm going to talk about injury in a second, but ASD status is not perfectly identified in these claims, Using the predictive, positive predictive value and estimated negative predictive values that we got from this exercise, what kind of bias was, would that put um, in an estimate of an association between ASD status and some health outcome? So we assume some situation where ASD was in truth associated with doubling the risk of a health outcome. What kind of bias would be introduced by the misclassification that we would see here? And the bias is relatively uh, small. So essentially, if the true relative risk associated with ASD was, was, was two, um, given this misclassification uh, associated with our claims-based case definition, we would estimate a relative risk of 1.89, which is fairly close to, to the truth of 2.0. So um, we, al we also observed that, that what we see here is a little bit better results than a couple of other studies that have been done validating claims-based case diagnosis for other uh, mental health conditions. There was one of uh, depression and uh, schizophrenia. But, but we, we know that we did not have the greatest gold standard here. Um, so we still have to be a little bit cautious about, about the level of confidence that we have in, in, in using claims-based diagnoses. But we thought it did support some potential for, 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 for using the administrative claims in these other ways that we want to talk about today. And generalizability, we, this is a privately insured population, and it's generalizable here, but we think it probably applies to other kinds of, of, uh, of health claims data sets. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about um, injury. So what we wanted to do here is we want to estimate an association between ASD and the risk of injury and determine if the effect is independent of comorbidity and assess whether ASD-associated injury risk varies by age. Um, there's been some literature suggesting that um, uh, individuals with uh, autism um, are at higher risk for injury. Um, this particular study that was, that was uh, published a couple of years ago uh, focused on uh, um, Use Medicaid claims. It focused on uh, emergency room related visits or hospital injury event episodes, serious injury event episodes, and it suggested that um, after some adjustment, the kids with ASD were at about a 20% higher risk for this serious injury than uh, were children without ASD. It didn't adjust for comorbid diagnoses and it didn't explore potential effect modification by uh, age. So what we did is we, we took our base sample, but we limited the ASD group to the, to the kids who met that, the criteria of having two claims for ASD. We used uh, an episode treatment group approach to define injury episodes. So this is helpful because um, it, it can limit double counting of injuries. One injury can generate multiple claims. And the episode treatment group approach has a way of aggregating those so you're not over counting injury uh, of events. Um, we also considered in our, in our analysis all injuries in all settings. It wasn't just limited to injuries that brought a child to the ED group. 
Uh, statistically, we use this counting process model, which is, is quite handy. All of our individuals had that six months minimum of continuous enrollment, but um, some of the kids in the sample could be enrolled for, for two different intervals. Um, so we were able to capture information from both of, from all their enrolled intervals because they can obviously experience injury, injury events in, in either of those enrolled uh, enrolled intervals. Uh, the counting process model is relatively assumption free, and it has some other statistical niceties, and it will estimate relative risks just like a regular Cox model does. So we, we included some socio demographics. We adjusted for for gender, for race, ethnicity, household income, and, and, and region, and we also looked at comorbid conditions that might be potentially associated with ASD and. Could also be associated with injury risk, and those were ADD, anxiety, depression, intellectual impairment, visual impairment, and seizure disorder. So um, before I show you a, a table, we, we saw um, on average the kids in the ASD group experienced um, a little bit under one injury over the follow-up period, so it was 0.87 injuries. And the comparison group experienced 0.55 injuries over the follow-up period. But the follow-up time varied. ASD kids were in our sample had longer enrollment, 44 months on average. The comparison had 31 months on average. So what did our model approach show us? Um, the, the, the first column of results is, is without any adjustment. The second column of results is with adjustment for demographic factors. I haven't listed all the things in the slide that we adjusted for. I just listed the things I wanted to, to talk about. But we did also adjust for those variables that I mentioned on the previous slide. And then, and then the third model also adds an adjustment for, for, for comorbidity. So looking at these slides, you see that the initial results suggested that kids with autism were about a 12% greater risk for an, an injury in our sample. After you adjust for demographics, that excess risk associated with autism seems to go down to about 3% excess risk. It's still statistically significant because this is a huge sample, remember. But then when you adjust for comorbidities that are associated with autism and with injury risk, the, um, the, the effect estimate flips in the other direction. And it looks like, in fact, controlling for those comorbidities, kids with autism are at, are at lower risk of injury. So it could be perhaps that the greater frequency of these comorbid symptoms that's, that's driving the injury risk. But before, I don't want to spend too much time on this, this slide because the, the, the most um, significant finding uh, had to do with the stratification that we did by age. So if we stratify the follow-up time into buckets defined by the, the child's age and look at the younger kids through the older kids, and there's four columns of results here, you see that the ASD effect is really modified by age and that for the youngest child, the excess risk associated with ASD persists. There's a thir almost a 30% excess risk of injury for these younger kids who are three to five uh, years of age. Then as the kids age, uh, in the five to 10 year old group, there's no association with ASD. Once we get to the older age groups, 11 to 20 and 21 and above, in fact, the, 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 the um, children with ASD are at lower risk of injury. So this is interesting and it's, perhaps not unexpected, um, if, if you think a little bit about what goes on here, that the ASD effect in the younger years is, is, is one of, of, of increasing risk, but in older years is one of decreasing risk. And sort of the, the social determinants of injury really change for very young kids compared to, to, to um, uh, adolescents um, and, and uh, older children. So this finding is kind of consistent with what one might expect, and it's the first time, as far as we know, that folks have looked at effect modification of age and injury on, on the relationship between ASD and the propensity for, for, uh, for, for these children experiencing injury. So um, this, we thought, was quite interesting. It showed that the relationship between ASD and injury risk was age-dependent, with ASD associated with increased risk at younger ages and decreased risk at, at older ages, independent of comorbidity. And it suggests that maybe there should be some, preventive, uh, some injury prevention efforts geared uh, at or near the time of diagnosis when children, children are young. There could be some public health impact there. So a couple of differences to the previous work that's been done. Um, uh, we, we considered injuries in any setting. We did not think about injury type or intentionality or severity. We didn't have that kind of information. Um, one other thing to note when you think about claims data and health outcomes is the issue of surveillance bias. Um, 
injuries, unlike other kinds of health outcomes, are a little bit less vulnerable to surveillance bias, which is the idea that when you're comparing a group of children who have a chronic health condition like autism, they're going to be they're going to have a closer connection to the healthcare system, and and health outcomes might be detected in that group only because of their closer connection to the healthcare system than a comparison group of children. Injuries, because they're an acute event, are a little bit less vulnerable to that, but we, we, we had ways of adjusting for that by including the number of preventive care visits that these kids experienced as a proxy for their care-seeking behavior, and, and that adjustment didn't, didn't alter our results at all. Okay, so, so that's what we did with respect to using claims data to gain some information on, on a health outcome of interest, in this case injury, and there were others that we looked at in the project as well. The last thing that we did is we explored the feasibility of, of, of claims for ASD risk factor research, and this, this I'll, I'll close with, uh, with, with this piece of work. So what we, what we, what we did here is we wanted to um, think about, what, out of this large data set, what proportion of these observations are going to be potentially informative for risk factor research? So which observations are going to have the data available on the relative individuals and the relative and relevant etiologic windows to allow us to say something about risk factors. Then we want to look at whether or not the observations that we can keep in this kind of an analytic data set, whether or not those subjects differ systematically from those that we can't study because that could introduce selection biases and we want to make sure that, 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 that those aren't major. And then we want to think about What's the quality of information about the potential risk factors that we can extract from this kind of a database? So um, the idea of the relevant information, well, if we think about when we want to look for autism risk factors, there's a lot of science suggesting that we should be looking in the prenatal period. And I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through um, uh, these these uh, individual studies, but um, we have. Uh, um, Proof of principles that environmental exposures in the prenatal period can cause autism. We have brain science work that shows that some of the, the signs of uh, um, the neuropath signs associated with autism would have to originate in utero, and, and those go back to, um, to uh, um, classic neuropath studies based on brains and new transcriptomics. They're all suggesting prenatal initiation. And then, and then work that uh, our, 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 my host for today um, uh, has done, and you all are probably familiar with, that, that, that suggested, in fact, that that preconception period may also be important in autism. And this is the work that's been done with, with, with folic acid that Rebecca led. So if we're going to use healthcare claims, we're going to have to be able to look at the experience in the prenatal and maybe even the preconception window on the samples that we would assemble. So, and this this is a is a challenge. So, the first thing we have to do is we have to see, okay, we have these groups of kids. How many can we link to their moms? Right. So this is this is is, is difficult. Um, while while the vast majority, 99%, almost all, were in a family plan, and almost all of these kids had an, one identifiable family member, um, and most of those family members, 92%, met our six months of continuous en enrollment criteria. Once we start whittling down um, with with. Um, to make these linkages, it gets extremely um, uh, challenging. Um, if you look at the ASD cohort, you see we start with, with uh, 53,000 family members. And through a family ID algorithm, so we know that there's a woman in the same family, and their age matches what could potentially be the, the child's mother, we get a group of 31,000 potential moms. Um, we, we look to make sure that the, the, the um, mom that we identify matches the child in the birth interval, right, in the study interval in 2001, 2009. That takes us down a little bit more to 13,000. Then we have to make sure that the child is enrolled at the time of the birth, and that brings that sample down to 3,400. And then we wanted to make sure that mothers were enrolled in the healthcare system around the time of the child's birth as well to make this to make sure we could do this linkage. And now we're down to about 2,800 moms linkable to these autism cases. Um, the last step, the last step at the bottom that refers to the Stork method, is just making just eliminates moms that were by chance linked to more than one child because then we couldn't be certain 
which, which, uh, which child was the right match for that mom. So the, the bottom line is um, even though we start with uh, um, a group of 33,000 kids with ASD, only 6.5% of them could be linked to a mother in this fashion where we could find the mother and we knew that we had the mom's claims at birth and could potentially look back into the prenatal window. So now we want to look at among these 2,000 or so moms that um, uh, we were able to link to, how far back could we go? Because we want to make sure, right, it's not just being linked at birth, it's going back into the pregnancy where we're going to want to look for events. And so we looked first at uh, 14 weeks back into pregnancy, covering sort of the, the, the third trimester. And 1670 of those uh, 2,000 moms, or about 75%, had some coverage back into the third trimester. If we look for moms where we had coverage throughout the entire pregnancy, that's that next row, 40 weeks back, it's a little over half. And then if we want to go back to preconception period, we get down to 25 percent, just 573 ASD cases with, that, with, with coverage for the mom going all the way back into the preconception period. And then if we, look at the, if we want to look at uh, um, um, uh, the period of pregnancy to 12 months postnatally, a thousand moms or about half. So once you start digging down and you need to make that match and you need to have coverage in the mom over the relevant etiologic window, the effective sample size is reduced fairly dramatically. Um, next, what we wanted to do is we looked at a, a whole series of potential ASD risk factors, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to go through this whole uh, list, but we looked at things that could potentially be measurable in claims. And that might be by etiologic window. So there were a variety of things we looked at during the prenatal period, during the preconception period, and also during the early postnatal window. And I'll, I'll just show you, I'll, I'll, I'm running a little uh, short on time, so I'll just show you a couple of results from that. So this, this first slide, and I apologize for the uh, um, busyness of the, uh, of the table, is uh, for maternal asthma. And if, you, and if you look at the columns, what the columns represent are those different groups of moms who had different coverage through the prenatal period. So the first column are the moms who had coverage back through the third trimester. And if we look there for, um, if we look there for uh, a criteria for asthma is the presence of one claim during that prenatal period, um, you, we see that uh, uh, approximately 7% of the moms had one claim. So what were we comparing this to? Well, we were comparing this to data that we got from the literature on the prevalence of asthma in, in, in mothers. And you can see that the range for um, uh, the uh, national data is between 3% and 8%. And what I'm showing you here is uh, prevalences from our comparison group. I shifted away from showing ASD results to the larger group, which was our comparison cohort, and trying to match that to the national prevalence data. And without going through all these numbers, essentially for asthma, we looked at a variety of different indicators. The prevalences that we would get for indicators of asthma during the prenatal period pretty much matched national expectations. Some things that really didn't. This was somewhat surprising. This is some more acute problems in pregnancy that we thought would be fairly well captured in claims. And these include indicators of, of infection. Um, and I show it here broken down by trimester, um, gestational diabetes, and uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia. Now, I also have maternal obesity show, sh uh, shown there, and that's one that we expect would not be well captured in claims. But the other four acute conditions, we thought we would get prevalences that would match external standards. And really, for most of these, we saw much higher prevalences. So in this case, we think that our system of coding probably was biased in some way. And we haven't had a chance to return to this. But for some exposures, we had good results in terms of the prevalences that we would get in our sample seemed to match national data. And then for others, though, it was not so good. There's been some interest in medications, and medication use in pregnancy is something that can be looked at really effectively through, through claims data. And, and here again, we had, we had prevalence estimates. If you look at the percent columns there for SSRIs and beta-2 agonists, two drugs of interest, that really matched national um, uh, expected levels. So another class of exposure that we were encouraged about for, for, uh, for potentially exploring in, in, in healthcare claims. 
So uh, what can we conclude about this? Well, so only about 4% of the ASD cohort was linked successfully to, 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 to moms. And the largest uh, um, uh, contributor to the loss of sample was that the moms weren't enrolled in the health plan at the time the baby was born. Um, but it's sobering because based on nine years of claims that we had from one of the top three uh, um, private insurers, uh, we got about 2,000 ASD cases that would be informative for um, etiologic questions that could be, you know, using exposures that could be captured in claims data. So now, 2,000 is nothing to sneeze at. It's a large sample, but it's, it's, it's very different in terms of magnitude from 33,000 where we, where we began. As far as selection effects, things were pretty encouraging. The proportions that we retained through this linkage to mom were about the same for the ASD group as the comparison group. So that suggests that we weren't differentially losing folks across these two groups. And when we did look at the demographic characteristics of those who we were able to retain and those that we were not, they were roughly similar. So it didn't look like there was any, any selection. Um, Information bias, how, how, how good are the claims at capturing these different variables? Well, we didn't do any formal criterion validity here. We just estimated these prevalences and compared them to national data. And for a number of risk factors, we saw things appearing at the, at the, at the, at the rate we would expect, which was good. But there were some things that were problematic, some that we expected. Obesity we didn't expect would be captured well in claims, and it wasn't. And then, but there were some things, acute pregnancy complications, that we thought we would do a good job on, and there were some problems that needed to be worked through. So uh, I've talked a little bit about, about um, validation of autism diagnosis in this claims database, using the claims database to assess some health outcomes. I give the example of injury, and also the idea of uh, can we um, move forward for risk factor research using claims. So um, I think that you know, as we as we think about this and think about doing more work in this area, you know, we, we have to of course remember that there are some inherent limitations of what we can do with claims. And and um, I probably didn't even uh, state this outright, but the kinds of health outcomes that we can look at in claims are of course those that are health outcomes that are going to be captured through the medical system. And we know that there are critical outcomes in autism that are never going to be captured in in healthcare claims data, behavioral outcomes, adaptive outcomes. So. Within that context, though, there might be some things that we can do. And the same on the risk factor side. There are going to be some autism risk factors that we're never going to be able to capture in, 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 through claims, including environmental exposures, environmental chemicals. But there are some things, like certain health conditions and medication use, that will be available. I think the, we need to do more validation work on a, ASD uh, case finding through claims. I think the, the study that we did was nice. It was a nice addition. But I think there needs to be more work on, on, on uh, using a claims-based diagnosis for autism. I think there's a lot of alluring power to the scale that we can, uh, that we can do things in claims data, though. Um, scale is very important um, in autism. I think our colleagues in genomics have realized that, that you have to go big or, or, or go home. And claims may be one way that we can go large uh, in the context of some work on health outcomes and risk factors. It will give us precision to detect effects that are probably pretty small but important. Um, Misclassification, the fact that we can't measure things purpose perfectly in claims is a problem, but scale can help compensate for that. If the misclassification is non-differential, by having a big sample size, really um, you, you can overcome the dilution of effect that you expect to see when there's non-differential misclassification. And then I think something else is that in claims data, we have the potential to employ some novel methods to control for confounders, which I didn't talk about here today. But there are techniques called propensity scores and the use of instrumental val uh, variables that are gaining traction in epidemiology and, and have a lot of potential for, um, for, for better confounder control. And we can implement these approaches in claims because of the richness of data that we have available there in terms of many diagnostic codes and many procedure codes. Um, there are already a number of initiatives underway to pool claims data sources. So I showed you information from one health plan and, and, and the group that they use to, uh, to, to keep track of and assemble their claims data sets. There are um, operations out there that pool claims from different health plans, some place called MarketScan, uh, uh, um, IMS LifeLink. And where we started with 62 million, these poolers are over 100 million in terms of individuals that are, that are covered in their amalgamated claims data sets. And, um, there's more initiatives underway, and the federal government is very interested in, in, in building large data sets, and I'll comment on that in a second. 
I think there are some barriers to moving forward to, with claims-based ba uh, work other than some of the, 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 the issues that I've touched on already. Cost is one of them. Uh, the pricing structure for claims data is really geared towards the private sector. A lot of the, the users of this information are pharmaceutical companies who have, um, you know, who are interested in uh, post-marketing surveillance and other things, and they tend to be able to pay um, a, a different kind of structure than academic researchers are used to. You have to have large data handling capacity, and that's something that, 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 that we certainly have, but there are some conventions and tricks to working with claims data that um, epidemiologists, at least, will have to get used to. Health services researchers and economists have been doing this, so I think that's certainly, um, certainly something that we, can, um, that we can move towards. There are privacy protection issues that you have to negotiate when you're dealing with these claims databases, but again, I think that's something that's quite surmountable. So, in some, I think claims have potential, and I think that this is something that I know I'm going to consider um, uh, pushing on with. Um, I do think, though, that there's a next wave that might not be too far away, and that's um, the idea that, okay, so claims are available, but there's a lot of push to integrate and consolidate information from electronic health records. And this is really where the federal government is investing under um, uh, 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 the PCORI initiative um, that was ushered in under, under uh, Obamacare, Patient Centers Centered Outcomes Research Initiative. There's um, a lot of moves underway for health systems to try to pool their electronic health records information. So not their back-end claims, but the actual medical records information, which would give us an even richer source of data to use for, for, for work like this in the future. A few years out, but very exciting. Hi. Uh, I had a question. The sample of about 46,000 children with ASD, do you have any indication of how it was broken down, like what percentage of those had autistic disorder, what percentage had PDD, NOS, uh, Asperger's, et cetera? Yeah, um, we, 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 um, those data were available, of course, because they're captured by ICD-9 codes, but we, we would, because we saw so much shifting, Right? If, you, if you would look at individuals who had more than one claim, the diagnostic category captured on the claim would often shift, so we were, we were not comfortable with reliably breaking down kids in those groups. So we decided to treat them as, as ASD, one class. Hi, Craig. Hi, Cheryl. This is outstanding work, obviously, especially trying to understand um, with the use of administrative databases, for instance, uh, how reliable the, the diagnosis of ASD is. I mean, that's just critical, so thank you. With respect to the pregnancy, I had one comment and one question. The comment is that um, as a prenatal provider myself, I think that the, the claims data is um, bound to be unreliable because uh, most prenatal providers have group um, rates, uh, global rates of reimbursement. So there's no pressure on them to put in additional diagnoses to somehow increase their reimbursement, which is what typically drives the reliability right. of other types of claims data. And so um, EHR, I think, is going to really solve a lot of those problems. Yeah. And I think a, a question with, so, so one thing to think about there is, 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 is um, that kind of underreporting, is it differential across autism kids and other kids? Probably not, especially because we don't know that there are autism kids. So right. it becomes a problem of non-differential class, misclassification, <laughs> which if your numbers are big enough, is something that you can you can you can work around. But I understand what right. you're saying. Right, so it'll dilute you toward the the, the right. null. Right. Um, and so I was wondering if if you were um, working with these insurance companies to try to get more information. Do they have additional information at their? Um, are they beginning to integrate any kind of EHR data into their portfolios? So the the. Um, the as I've understand, as I've waded into this, the insurance companies aren't so much trying to do that. That's happening. That's happening more with the integrated health systems. Um, and um, I've, I've been involved in other projects, writing grants with with, with health systems that um, are are in fact trying to do that. But the the the, the insurers aren't doing that. They're still sort of working with the, 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 the claims databases. They're interested in pooling them and getting larger samples, but um, I haven't seen anything about the insurers trying to integrate the EHR information, but the health systems are, in fact, very interested in doing that. I had another question. Um, you mentioned that uh, one of the results of your investigation was that children at younger ages with autism were at substantially greater risk for injury, but right. as they got older, this risk went away. Right. And then you said that was independent of comorbidity. So do you mean by that, that occurs whether or not 
the children had a comorbid condition? So no, that what we, we that analysis wasn't stratified by comorbidity. It means that the uh, um, the fact that let's just take to, to think this through. Let's just take, let's just say there's one comorbidity. Let's say we're dealing with ADD, and let's say that kids with ADD-like symptoms are more are more susceptible to injury. Let's say that kids with autism, a greater proportion of them have ADD-like symptoms. Right. So one reason you might see higher rates of injury in kids with autism is just because they've got the, there's more of them that have the ADD-like symptoms. So you adjust that out, and you still see, in the younger kids, the injury rates being higher among those with autism. So that's what that adjustment does. So you did mention that there was no real information about types of injury in your database, but could you give us any insights into what, you know, a sampling of types of injuries that might have shown up? Well, so so there actually there actually is some information on injury type. We just we just didn't didn't look at that. And in fact, those the episode treatment groups that we used do consider injury in a couple of broad in a couple of categories, but that we didn't do analyses separately on them. Um, I believe there are four, and they they are trauma, uh, burns, environmental injuries such as uh, um, drowning. And I think poisoning is another category. But the e-codes that code for injuries can get quite specific. So it is, it is possible in claims to look specifically at different types of injuries. We just didn't do it. I mean, p part of the reason we would have liked to, part of the reason was in this kind of a, a you know, we had so much to do for this, for this contract that we you know, weren't able to move back and examine everything that, was, that, that, piqued, that piqued our interest. But you, you, can, you can do that with claims. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.